This is Regenerative Skills, the podcast helping you to learn the skills and solutions to create an abundant and connected future. I'm your host, Oliver Gaucher. New Society Publishers has been a leader in sustainable publishing for over 40 years now. They're an activist, solutions-oriented publisher focused on bringing you tools for a world of change. They've now published over 600 books available both in print and ebooks, as well as an increasing library of audiobook selection as well. They care deeply about both what they publish and how they do business, and so the same thinker and doer approach permeates their in-house work and the books themselves. A certified B Corporation, they print on 100% post-consumer recycled paper, and they are carbon neutral, and they print only in North America, never offshore. And that's just the company themselves. Most importantly, they've got the best selection of books that you need to build your own regenerative ecological or community-based projects. You can check out their full list of titles now at newsociety.com. Hey there, everybody, and welcome back. So the growing popularity of permaculture food forests and backyard multi-species orchards is part of a movement that I'm 110% in support of. Any addition of native and food producing plants in diverse, multi-species configurations is a wonderful thing. I really wanna see as many people as possible find success with these plantings. And that's why I've been a bit concerned by the way that many designers and landscapers oversell the benefits and the expectations to people who want to plant their first fruit trees and expect to get a yield from them. Now, that isn't to say that it's a ton of work or unrealistic and you shouldn't expect to get meaningful harvest from your fruit trees, but I do want to make sure that first-time growers have realistic expectations of the maintenance and growth cycles of their fruit trees so that they can manage them and find the success that they're looking for. Caring for a fruit tree or a small orchard is a growing journey for both the plants themselves and the people who care for them. And to shed light on the full journey of growing fruit trees, I got in touch with Susan Poisner. Susan is an urban orchardist in Toronto, Canada, and the author of the award-winning fruit tree care book, Growing Urban Orchards. She's an instructor of fruit production at Niagara College in Ontario, and the creator of the award-winning online fruit tree care training program at orchardpeople.com. Susan is also the host of the Urban Forestry radio show and podcast, and is an ISA certified arborist. Now in this conversation, Susan and I talk about the differences between caring for a few fruit trees or a small community orchard in the city and what most people associate with orchard maintenance in a farm context. From there, we go methodically through the essential considerations of selecting fruit tree varieties for both resilience and production, planting considerations to give them the best conditions to start with, maintenance and pruning in the early years to ensure vigorous growth, tips and tricks to increase harvest and fruit quality, and a whole lot more. We even talk about Susan's learning journey in developing a community orchard and some of the unexpected challenges that came up. And we cover so much in a short time in this conversation, so instead of droning on, let's just jump in as I hand things over now to Susan Poisner. So welcome, Susan. It's a pleasure to have you on the show today. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Oliver. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I am really excited to have this conversation. As many listeners of this show know, I am at the beginning stage of starting a tree nursery and planting out an agroforestry system and the challenging conditions I have in northeastern Spain here. And you yourself have quite a body of knowledge and experience with working, especially with smaller scale agroforestry, orchard or food forest projects. And to start us off, why don't you tell us, first of all, how you got interested in this topic and what was the learning journey to to get into this? Oh, my gosh. Well, I, I got into it very naively, actually. Um, and, you know, this was about 14 years ago. And at the time, there were a lot of community gardens in my neighborhood. I was a newish gardener and I saw the magic of nature and I love food. And so, you know, my husband and I were growing tomatoes in the backyard and zucchinis. And it was awesome. And I thought oh my gosh, you know, this is a lot of work. You have to weed and you have to water and stuff. Wouldn't it be great to have fruit trees? And we live in a city. We don't have the hugest backyard. And we had a park just up the road that nobody went to. It was a total dive. Nobody would hang out there. And I thought, hey, why don't we plant fruit trees there? I had heard this concept of a community orchard, but it was still very new at the time. 
So I'm thinking that this is the most brilliant idea ever. Why didn't anybody ever think about this before? And I'm a project person. I'm a writer. I'm a journalist. I'm a filmmaker. I can communicate my dream. So I went out and I said, this is what I want to do. I found people who wanted to do it with me. And I got in touch with the city and have had at the time the best park supervisor ever who loves fruit trees. And I said, you know, I have something I want to do in the park. And he said, great, we love community involvement. What do you want? Do you want a, an annual garden? Do you want something like that? And I said, no, I want a community orchard. And I was bracing myself for a big no, a big fat no. <laughs> and in the end, I got, wow, what a fantastic idea. I love fruit trees. I will help you do this. So we had to go to the community and we had to talk to our city councilor and we went through all sorts of ups and downs and challenges. But in the end, we got the right to plant trees, 14 to start off with. Um, and there are ups and downs we can talk about at some point. But you ask me where the challenging part came in. And the challenging part came in not right away when we planted the trees. We felt very proud of ourselves. There we were with a park with a bunch of young fruit trees and dreams in our minds of blossom times and harvests and community. And so we waited. And we waited and we waited and we knew the harvest would take a little while, but it was only about two years after planting that the problem started. Because even if you buy, if you buy a somewhat healthy tree from a nursery and you plant it, even if you really are awful to it, it'll probably survive at least six months, even if you don't water it. And fruit trees, they can look pretty good for a year or two, but when the diseases and pests start moving in, that's when the problems start. And at that point, you're already two years into the journey. You've wasted two years of your time when those two years should have been used to building up the health of the fruit tree. And I'll say one more thing. Fruit trees are kind of like children. So if a child is neglected and malnourished when it is just a baby, it will struggle with poor health for the rest of its life. And fruit trees are the same. If we don't plan ahead and know what we're doing before we plant those trees, it is not, it's going to be an uphill battle from that point on. So that's how I learned. I learned the hard way. I did it all wrong. <laughs> and because it was a public space and I felt responsible, I did not want this project to be a failure. My responsibility was to dive in and learn at first, all I wanted to know was what is the minimum I need to do to keep these fruit trees healthy and productive? And then I went into the rabbit hole from there. Yeah, I understand that journey as well. I've gone the same way by starting out with a lot of excitement and hope for something and then realizing that there's so much more to it, especially when it comes to the maintenance. And I think that is very similar to a lot of people who get especially excited about things like permaculture design or starting a garden or many of the other things around this space. The emphasis, the excitement is put on the design and the implementation, not in the journey, the maintenance that's required to see these things thrive in the long term and the co-evolution that's required for you to grow along with your system. The, the issues the challenges that you're going to face in two years are not necessarily or quite likely very different from the ones that you start with in the beginning. So tell me a bit about the, the evolution of your project, some of the challenges in starting from the planting phase and what you were forced to learn when things started to go a little <laughs> off plan about two years down. So Interesting you talk about the planning stage. The planning stage, you're right, it was filled with excitement. It was also filled with some controversy. There were people in the community who were concerned and did not want an orchard in the park. And in a way, that was good for me. In a way, it's good for how to have that opposition because it keeps you accountable. If you're starting a project like this and, you know, the municipality is like, rah, rah, you go, you go. When things go wrong... There, you, you, you can look at those people and say, oh, but you told me to do it, right? So the fact that, the, that I had quite a lot of people who were concerned that this was going to be a big mess with lots of fallen fruit everywhere, neglected trees, diseases flying from tree to tree. Yeah, they were right. That could have, that could have been what would have happened. So I had to be accountable. So the process was that one by one, the trees started getting sick. And Human nature, or let's call it Susan nature, 
well, let's say I would walk by a pear tree with spots all over its leaves and think, well, maybe next year it'll be better. It'll get better. It'll get better on its own, you know? And the next year it was 10 times worse. So the secret is that I'm not sure that everybody knows with fruit tree diseases, you can leave them. But what happens is the spores over winter. So let's say you leave diseased leaves around your the, the base of your tree. And let's say they have rust, orange spots on the leaves. And you think, okay, it'll be better next year. Well, those spores don't die over the winter, even on a cold winter. And not only that, they come back like 10 times stronger. So that's what happened. So I left the rust for the first year. We got it worse the second year. And other diseases happened um, uh, to the different trees. And I started to feel totally overwhelmed. I will never learn this. It started to dawn on me that if planting orchards was so easy, why isn't organic fruit cheap? Why doesn't everybody buy a plot of land, plant lots of Honeycrisp fruit trees on them and make a fortune? Like it's just, it, it dawned on me how naive I was. So um, I had no choice. I had to figure out what to do. So I raised money. I'm good at writing grants. And I got experts from the uh, fruit region outside. Um, it's called the Niagara region. It's in Ontario where I live. So I paid for people to come in and teach us. How do we prune the trees? What, how is pruning going to improve the health? Well, it, it plays a big role in having healthy trees. Correct annual pruning. Um, how do we identify these diseases? When we identify them, what do we do with them? And like I suggested before, the earlier you catch those diseases, the less they'll be a problem. Once you wait for them to be widespread, there's no one spray you can just spritz on your tree to make it all better. It doesn't work like that. And I even wonder if with human health, it's the same thing. We wait until we're really sick. We go to the doctor and say, patch us up. And they're like, oh, sorry, this is quite far gone. This is going to take a while to heal, if at all. So same thing. So uh, for three years, I brought in people from the Niagara region, felt totally overwhelmed. And then I decided, okay, I'm a journalist. I can make sense of this information. I, I have to be able to do this. So I did what I do as a journalist. I started to write about it to understand what they're saying to me, to make these difficult concepts simple for myself and for my volunteer group. And so my first step was writing my book, Growing Urban Orchards, which told our goofy and ridiculous story, but it also explained the lessons that we learned so that other people don't have to make those mistakes. They've seen Ben Nobleman Park did it. They made the mistakes for everybody. Nobody ever has to make those mistakes again. And we learned a bunch of lessons. So I'll just summarize them quickly. If you choose the right trees, you will have less problems. So choosing disease resistant trees that are good for your climate zone, that will cross pollinate with each other, that are on correct root stocks. So that's the first thing. The second thing is pruning your fruit trees annually from the very year you plant your first tree from the very day you plant your first tree, you will start pruning it to create a strong fruit bearing structure for that tree that will last a lifetime. And pruning is gonna be important because you're opening up the canopy to air circulation. Instead of having a big tangled mess of branches where pests and diseases can just be happy and multiply, you have this big open canopy that the air goes through and the sunshine comes into and dries it up in a good way and protects the tree. So there's pruning, there's choosing the right tree, there's pest and disease prevention. And I figured out all sorts of tricks about the easiest ways to do that. And young tree care, I also would say, when the tree is first planted, really nurturing it in the correct way will give it a great start to life. So those are amongst the things that I started to learn. And it literally took me years. In the end, because I'm a filmmaker, become, because I'm an educator, I ended up teaching courses on the subject, which I teach online at uh, my website. Brilliant. And I think those are good patterns that the specifics may look different in different climates, for different trees, right? But the, the concepts there are very sound and can be pretty broadly applied. Tell me- And that's, oh, sorry, just to say, that's the amazing thing. Like I started, here I am in Canada, right? I'm doing this in Canada. 
And my online students are from across North America, from all different parts of North America, from California, from whatever. I have students in Germany, Austria, Australia. Um, I even have a student in India. And it's because the concept and the science is the same. This, just like the science of the human body is the same depending, it doesn't matter where the human is. Once you understand the science, you can apply it to you, your, your adventure wherever you live. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so let's understand a bit of the context that you have the most experience with from where you are in Ontario. Tell me about your soil conditions, your climate a bit, and which cultivars you decided to plant in the beginning, and perhaps what you might recommend now that you've learned otherwise. Okay, so here in Canada, so I'm in Toronto, I'm in a city, and um, the soil that our, our trees are planted in is a city park. And on this site, 60 years ago, there used to be an apartment building. So I know you mentioned that your soil is quite challenging. Our soil is challenging too. Some of the trees are planted on a berm uh, that was created as a result, probably as a result of digging out the foundation of the apartment building. Pretty terrible soil. You dig down, you get a lot of rocks, rocks somehow. And so that's the first thing that you really need to fight your way through and figure out. There are some parts of the park where it's a little bit nicer soil, depends on what it is. The soil is heavy in clay, so it's dense. Um, the good part of clay is it's going to have a lot of nutrition in it. The bad part of clay, it's not going to have a lot of great drainage. So and not going to absorb water. Quickly as well, yeah. Exactly. And, and the thing that I tell people is, you know, with fruit trees, like they don't have teeth and they can't chew. So they have to take in all their nutrients in liquid form. So if I can't get the liquid to the root system, then they're just going to starve as well as become dehydrated. So those are the challenges. Um, our climate is changing as I think it is everywhere. We used to have very cold winters. Sometimes now we don't have very cold winters. So that's unreliable. Um, so that's our situation, but we do have winter dormancy in terms of uh, these are deciduous trees. There are no you know, leaves on the trees that we can't grow evergreen trees like citrus in our park. We're growing apples, pears, apricots, uh, cherries, plums, uh, that kind of thing. So those are our challenges. Yeah, that makes sense. And that is not dissimilar from what I remember growing up in Minnesota, but is quite different from where we are in the Mediterranean region, even though we are at high elevation and do still get colder conditions than people down at the coast. And so what are the details of how you've implemented some of those patterns that you mentioned earlier? We were going back to the cultivars that you chose in the beginning. Certainly they need to be adapted to the climate or quite frankly, they won't make it through those winters. But beyond just the, the broad range of cultivars that are available, how do you choose something more specific, like you said earlier, for disease and pest resistance from the beginning? So it's, and again, that was something that I remember when I was talking to my park supervisor at the time, the very first one, he was trying to explain to me about cross-pollination and that you have to have some trees need partners. And then he was saying about the climate zones and my head was just exploding. I'm like, what? this is like a jigsaw puzzle. So I ended up creating a course, which I ended up teaching other people and I still teach it where it takes two hours, but I take you through the journey step by step to find your first thing is to make sure that the tree will survive in your climate zone. So a lot of the people listening to this podcast, that will be intuitive for them. They're not going to buy an, um, you know, like a, a lemon tree to plant in Minnesota. You know, it's not going to, that's not going to happen. So climate zone is of course important, but the thing is, in terms of disease resistance, there are many cultivars um, that are just easier to grow because they are not vulnerable to the common diseases. Apples is a great example because apples get all sorts of diseases. Apple scab, fire blight, um, all sorts of things like that, rust. Uh, so there are cultivars that have been naturally sort of uh, bred not you know genetically modified, but naturally bred to be resistant. Selective breeding to, we're talking about. Yeah. yeah, selective breeding to to those diseases. 
So here in Canada and lots of North America, there are lots of different options. We have some, like one of my favorite is an early producing apple called Pristine, crispy, juicy, and it's like ready in August. It's the best apple ever, but people don't know about it because they can't buy it in the supermarket. Yeah. Sometimes you'll find it at a farmer's, farmer's market if you're lucky. So we have Pristine. There's other disease resistant cultivars like Nova Mac, Liberty, Freedom, um, and I would say to anybody who is planting, certainly a community orchard, who, who is planting a new orchard and does not want to have a lot of struggles, I would definitely op opt for the disease resistant options. And at the same time, the beginning? what's because, that? Like you said, these are not cultivars or not varieties no. that are easy to find. You certainly won't find them in most grocery stores. How did you learn about these options and what their advantages are? Oh, Oliver, 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 from making mistakes. Oh my God, it was a total disaster. <laughs> oh my gosh. So when you see what happens is as a journalist, like you ask questions a lot. You think, why isn't this working? And uh, somehow I went into the rabbit hole and realized I shouldn't be buying my fruit trees from the garden center. I shouldn't be buying my fruit trees from the big box store because they only carry the cultivars that are um, popular with people who go to supermarkets because those are the people who are going to buy those cultivars. So I discovered this thing called a specialist fruit tree nursery. And I'm like, oh my gosh, there's places for this. Mm -hmm. And I looked at their catalog and I thought, wow, um, they have stuff I've never heard of. And then, as I said, I, I'm a... I just interview people. I talk to people. I talk to experts. Like I said, my quest was to find out what is the minimum I need to do to keep these fruit trees healthy and productive. And I realized the minimum I need to do is get the right trees in the first place. Yeah. So over the years, a lot of our trees have been, we've killed them. We've did, we, we didn't kill them. The disease either killed them or they were so diseased that we had to dig them up and replace them. So over time, we only replace with disease resistant trees. Yeah, yeah, that's good advice for anybody. I think it's a shame that the full range of varieties that are available and that were historically grown are so hard to locate right now. It's a big motivation as per what I'm going to be planting out here and to make that available through the nursery that I'm building. But uh, there are fortunately still specialty nurseries and and breeding facilities that you can get these but it does require a bit more investigation asking around finding people who know and figuring out which of them are actually adapted to your location because you might find one let's say from Ontario that's from over here in Europe and you could get them but it's not going to necessarily help you out with what your challenges are so finding them as close to where you are from as local as possible makes a big difference. So on my website at orchardpeople.com, if people go into the search uh, the search bar and, and put in nursery, I have a fruit tree nursery uh, resource list. So I've compiled, I hope, I, I might have missed one or two, but most of the nurseries across North America that specialize in fruit trees. So people can go to that list and find some nurseries near them now, or either near them or in a climate similar to their own. Yeah. Um, it's hard to get fruit trees sent across the border. So if you're in uh, the United States, get, go for a U.S. nursery. If you're in Canada, go for a Canadian nursery. Um, but yes, that is a great place to start your research. And then you're going to have to tick a few boxes as you go along to make sure you've got the climate zone, to make sure you've got the root stock that's appropriate and the cross-pollination <clears throat> requirements are fulfilled. Yeah. All right. So we've got our cultivars selected. We're sourcing them from a good spot. Now, let's talk about planting because there's a lot of options here. And as you mentioned before, getting them started and thriving while they're young can really determine the success and the productivity of the trees later on. So what are the most important things that you've learned to consider? Um, first of all, my preference, and I'm passionate about it, is to buy from a fruit tree nursery and to make sure you're buying bare root fruit trees. And they should be, <laughs> yes, I see you saying, yeah, you go, girl. Yeah, big thumbs uh, up for big, that because it's what I plan on producing. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Oh, my gosh. What Let's talk difference. about bare root stock. Why is this so important? Uh, 
Well, I can see the difference. In the in the early years, we planted both potted and uh, bare root trees. And you think about it. The potted trees are older. The wood is hardened up. The roots have been squished into a pot. And the roots are used to the type of soil that they are in. So they're kind of spoiled and they don't really want to. They'd love to be outside the pot. But then they come into your soil, which may have lots of different qualities. And it's like, oh, what is this? Right? It may be too hard for them to push through. So when you take a bare root tree and as young as possible, I like whips. I like one-year-old trees. The younger, the better. Little, All it looks like is like one single branch with no like side branching and some roots. And people will say, oh, this isn't good value. I spent, you know, $36 for this one, you know, little stick with roots on it. Oh my gosh, it's great value. But Susan, you have why to is that? Because we want to get production right away in the first or the second year. That's going to take, what, four or five years minimum in a lot of cases. Why is and that still advantageous? Because bare root trees grow faster. Because bare root trees are healthier. And because when you have that young a tree, you will be pruning it from the first year you plant it and you will, and that will be your way to create a strong fruit bearing structure for your tree. You can have an older tree. I was, I helped out on a site where they paid a lot of money. They wanted a big old mature tree, not old, but maybe it was like, oh, six, seven years old. They planted this big apple tree, big, and it even probably had apples on it when they bought it. They popped it in the ground and they thought they had their express route to fantastic harvest for year to, years to come. The problem is this tree is so established that the root system is going to be like, what is this? The, the energy of the tree is going to go into the fruit rather than expanding the root system far and wide to make a nice stable tree. And in the end, they might get fruit for a year or two, but after that, it's going to be a struggling and unhealthy tree. Again, let's do a children comparison. You know, I don't know about kids. If you have a kid and like when they're six years old, you need to move to one country, they have to make new friends. And then you need to move to another country. They learn a new language. They have to find new friends there. They don't have time to establish themselves. They don't have time to dig in their root systems in one place. And it's the same thing with a fruit tree. The younger you get it, it adapts to that new environment. It settles in and then it can be really strong and provide you beautiful harvests for 25 plus years. Yeah. Or you can rush, you can get a big tree, get a harvest that year and it goes downhill from there. It's it Take your pick. Yeah, and I get so many requests about people wanting to establish perennial food production that is as low maintenance as possible. And this is where it really becomes valuable to delay that instant gratification and invest in resilience. And the lower maintenance comes from that established root system that has found water sources or deeper groundwater that has accessed minerals and stuff that the profile is not going to allow it to, that isn't root ground, that doesn't have all these problems from basically growing up on fertilizer and constant watering, which is not a great way to get something established in, let's face it, constantly changing and increasingly difficult conditions out in the real world. Absolutely. And I challenge those people to think about it differently. So when you're producing a harvest, let's, I can only talk about fruit trees. I'm not an expert in planting vegetables I like doing it. I enjoy it. But fruit trees have been like learning about and growing for 14 years. Think of it differently. Think of, are you interested in becoming a partner with your fruit tree? Mm. Do you want to root work together with your fruit tree to produce a beautiful harvest? It doesn't have to be a burden. It can be a joy. It doesn't have to be a full-time job. But you, the grower, are 50% of the equation. If you want to create a landscape where you're 5% of the equation, it's not going to be a happy landscape. You're leaving your children on their own to go find their own way, right? So I would say that the minimum that people need to commit to is loving their trees, nurturing them when they're young, pruning them annually. And it is one of the funnest part of fruit tree care. Mm. It is everybody loves pruning. It's my chance to have a conversation with my fruit tree, to connect with my fruit tree, to watch it grow and to help 
work with it to create this structure. And then when you harvest that fruit, that's just, that's not just the fruit tree. That's the fruit tree rewarding you for your part of the, the, the adventure. So I know people want easy to grow landscapes and there. I've learned a lot about that myself. Um, you know, I would like to redo my backyard and I've got totally different, uh, a different approach that I would have taken 10 years ago. Um, so I've learned and I, you also need to know what you're willing to do, what you're not willing to do. And you learn that over time, but feeding your tree properly annually, not with bottles and lotion potions from the garden center, um, you know, pruning it annually and doing a little bit of work to protect your fruit tree from pests and diseases. It comes from knowledge. Once you have that knowledge, it's, it's intuitive, but you got to get the knowledge first. For sure. For sure. I really like that perspective on that. You're building a relationship here and we're not talking about multi, multi acre orchards. This isn't something that's going to be too repetitive. Most of the context that we're speaking about is smaller backyard orchards, maybe a community orchard or a couple of fruit trees in your backyard. And so it's really worth taking the time to care for them and their individual needs because we're not focused just on the efficiency of production and getting a task done. This is an opportunity to, like you said, steward and create a relationship with this entity that is going to nourish you and hopefully be with you for, you know, maybe quarter century or longer. Longer. Yeah. yeah. And also, I think the other thing that I was afraid of when I started is like, OK, you know, at first I thought, did I make a mistake? Uh, this I'm not I don't want to do this as my full time job. This is not what I want to do. And for me, it took a long time to figure it out because there wasn't one resource that answered, you know, my needs. But now there is, there is, you know, for instance, my course takes eight hours, the certificate of fruit tree care course. And after eight hours, you're good. Just, just eight hours of like picking away a little video every day, just a 15 minute video a day. And then you're done. And then you're like, oh, Oh, that's all I have to do to take care of my tree. I understand why. I understand how it's practice. You know, your pruning takes a little practice. You only do it once a year, but it doesn't take up my entire life. And it's just a joy. Yeah, absolutely. I it's something I really enjoy as well. And I think by framing it in that relationship building sort of way, it takes it away from being a chore and frames it more as an opportunity, which I love. So let's go beyond choosing the rootstock and to actually prepping the ground that it's going to go into for its success in the long term. How do you approach digging the hole? And do you focus on any soil amendments or preparations to get it started correctly? Yeah, great question. Again, one of my embarrassing situations I will share with you. Um, so I did learn early on uh, that, you know, check the site first, because I was helping other people, they wanted to start community orchard, so they'd hire me to come and, and have a look at, and I'd have a look at the site and make sure that it was full sun. Fruit trees do not thrive in the shade. So you can have the best fruit tree, best cultivar, disease resistant, even great soil, but in the shade, not going to be good. So I'd come, I'd have a look at the site, but what I didn't do was dig the hole. I didn't do a little checking of the soil in terms of, oh, let's dig a hole here and let's see what it's like. So this particular site, um, I, I said to them, okay, well, you know, get, make sure we all have shovels so we can dig holes. And they said, no, 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 um, we'll dig the holes for you. It'll be difficult. And I'm thinking, why is it going to be difficult for us to dig the holes? It's part of the fun, dig the hole. And they said, no, no, we'll take care of it. I should have asked more questions. I got there. And what I realized is this site had been a parking lot. And they had removed the asphalt or whatever was on top, but they left, I think this is legal. They had left the six inches of crushed gravel. The road so what this site was, was crushed gravel, like for six, eight inches. Wow. And then somebody put on top some soil and then they put grass on top of that. So we had these big holes. So I would say first thing after my experience, you got your site, just take a shovel first, even before you buy your tree, dig a hole. Let's see, see what, see what the soil even looks like. Is it filled with rocks? Is it, um, you know, is it nice and soft? Is it hard? Is it really sandy? Because that might help you even consider which trees to buy. Some trees are on root stalks that 
really can handle heavy clay soil and some aren't. So that's part of your consideration. Okay, so how I dig the hole. Um, so we get together, we have our bare root tree and we look at what the roots are gonna be like if they are stretched out far and wide in all different directions. We don't want the roots to be tangled or swirling around. And we wanna dig a nice big wide hole, probably a foot deep and make sure that you never cut those roots for to, so they fit in the hole. You want the hole to match the roots if they are stretched out beautifully. So you'll dig this big, beautiful hole. And then you do this as a team. You put like a tool, like, um, uh, you know, like a shovel or something across the hole. So you remember where the soil line is. And you make sure that that graft union on your grafted tree, because all fruit trees are grafted. So where they've got a separate rootstock sort of grafted onto the top part, which is the scion wood or the fruit wood. So you'll see the little bump where the graft is. That needs to be above the soil line. You don't want to bury that. So then we backfill. We Somebody holds the, the tree in the right place, and then we backfill with the soil. We very rarely, if, if the soil is absolutely terrible, I might mix in a little bit of soils from somewhere else, like triple mix or something, not pure compost or anything like that. That might be too harsh for the young roots. So, But usually we just use native soil because it's going to have to get used to it anyways. And we backfill and then we water deeply. Now, another thing that we have done in the past that I like is before we even put the tree in, we fill up the hole with water, let it drain out, and then put a little bit more water, let it drain, and then do the planting. It's just kind of to prime the area with a little bit of moisture. Yeah, I'm a big fan of that method too. It reduces transplant shock, which is kind of the term for going from whatever soil it was put into as a pot, or if it's bare root like that, um, going into a dry environment. I mean, if you want to think about it even more mechanically, you do the same thing if you're going to be setting cement into the ground, because if it's dry soil, it'll suck all that moisture out of the cement that you just put in it, cause it to crack and not set correctly. Well, think of it similarly, if that's your reference, uh, to doing so with trees. It'll pull the moisture out if that soil is not already moist and will stress the plant in its new environment, which is the last thing that you want that can inhibit growth. And yeah, I, I really agree with that method. I love that parallel. That's so interesting. I've learned, so, that's interesting because I didn't know how that, that you do that with cement. No, the funny thing is I came from construction and natural building before I went into <laughs> permaculture and ecosystem restoration and regen ag. So a lot of my references to make it make sense to me are from the building world. <laughs> oh, interesting. No, that makes total sense. Okay, so let's say you do have challenging conditions in your soil, or you know from whatever experience or even doing soil tests that there's little nutrition, or there's little microbio, um, <laughs> there's, there's very little life in the soil. Oh, I can't say the word right now. Do you use any amendments, any inoculants, any uh, additions, either compost or anything else to give that a kick and start the nutrition cycle going down where the roots are making this connection for, for nutrients? In the first year, we do very little um, because, again, we want the tree to adapt to its new environment. We don't want to burn young roots using anything. In, in our community orchard, as long as your um, soil, and we did start off with the soil trust, as long as it is no major nutritional deficiencies, then, and you, you'll test the soil first. And if it's more or less okay, I plant the tree, I do very little. I might... Um, you know, yeah, I don't even, maybe I'll put an inch of compost in a circle, you know, in a mulch circle around it, but I'm not sure. Do we do that sometimes? I don't often put wood chips on top because wood chips can suck the nitrogen out of the soil. Yeah. But here's what I do. Starting from a year after planting, every single springtime, we lay out two inches of uh, compost around the roots. Mm -hmm. It mustn't touch the, the trunk of the tree. So you've got a, a six inches of no, no, no mulch, because if it touches the trunk of the tree, it can rot that wood. It can yeah. be an entry point for pests. So you get a, you do this donut shape and every year that donut of mulch around the tree that you put down every spring will get bigger. So every year we pull back the grass a bit more and expand that circle. And the reason is it goes back to how fruit trees grow. So fruit trees have roots. 
But the woody roots aren't the ones that actually take in water and nutrition. It's the little feeder roots, the little tiny, tiny roots that are always moving outwards to find new water and nutrition. So those think of those little feeder roots being under the edge of the canopy of your tree or the drip line of your tree. So every year the drip line gets bigger, the canopy gets bigger, the drip line is further away and the feeder roots are further away. So if your mulch circle is just, you know, around the tree trunk itself, you're not actually feeding the tree anything yeah. because the feeder roots are somewhere else. Yeah. And in fact, if you want to encourage your tree to reach out even further, then every year you do want to extend that mulch circle because the, the roots are going to say, hey, there's some good nutrition out there. I think I'll reach a little more. In the end, you're going to have a much more stable tree with this big, lovely, expansive root system. So nutrition is very important. If you test your soil and you, you find out that there are nutritional deficiencies and it's kind of serious and you want to give your fruit trees the best chance of success, I would, success, I would say then you need to think of before planting your tree, amend the soil, plant some cover crops and leave it for a year and then plant the following year. Once you've allowed those microbes that are in the soil to sort of multiply, to get stronger, because those microbes in the soil will be supporting your fruit tree. Their job is to take the nutrition from the soil, to process it, and to release it in a, um, uh, in a way, in a liquid form that the tree can take in to nourish itself. Yeah, I like that. And that uh, reference as a crown of the tree, as that grows bigger, so does the radius of mulching that you should consider. I'm curious about your take on things like companion planting and creating beneficial relationships with other plants at various levels of everything from ground cover to bushes and maybe even companion trees that will help to do part of the maintenance, but also the the balance of health and relationships that can form here. Is this something that you focus much on? I love that you asked the question, Oliver, and I love the question. And my answer is not going to be predictable for a lot of people, especially your listeners. I love the idea of a polyculture, you know, garden. I love the idea of permaculture. I am a fruit tree person. And, and Young fruit trees do not like competition. They, can, they can't handle it. If they're competing with like some bigger, stronger plant, the other plant is just going to take a lot of the nutrition. So in my ideal orchard or a food forest environment or permaculture garden, I would not plant strawberries, for instance, all up to the roots of the tree because I'm always, you know, working with that tree, not always, but I'm pruning it every year. I don't want to be trampling on top of strawberries or whatever else. Um, I love the idea of having lots of shrubs and, and plants of different sizes, but they will never be so close to the tree that it will get in the way of um, me working with the tree. And they will also not be planted until those trees establish themselves. So I'm okay with even, you know, some cover crops. I totally love the idea of putting chives and, and certain types of like oniony plants around your fruit trees. It will not happen, however, in the first year when I plant those trees, it'll be much later. Hmm. Okay. And let's see, what about things to encourage the life within the soil? We talked about mulch. That serves a lot of purposes, part of which is breaking down, turning into compost, which feeds the soil food web, but also creates shade for the soil, helps to lock moisture in there, basically mimics forest soil conditions in an accelerated sort of way. Do you have some insights on what works best for mulch, some rules of thumb for application and some do's and don'ts? Absolutely. I have one huge thing to share. So one of my heroes is John Kempf, and he is the most interesting person. Um, I had him on my radio show a year or so ago, um, and it just changed everything for me. Basically, what he helped me to understand 
is that by helping your fruit tree photosynthesize to its maximum, to its healthiest maximum, you will actually be improving the soil. So how do you do this? So I've done two podcasts on the topic, one with John Kempf, one with Nigel Palmer. And the idea is we spray the trees and I, I, I'll say the word holistic sprays and some people might be turned off because what is a holistic spray? It's just a term. Think of it as spraying your tree with a mix of ideally rainwater, but if you have to just use city water mixed with something like a little tiny bit of molasses, um, it could have other things in it. It could have a little bit of um, fish emulsion in there just a bit. It could have a little Epsom salt. There's certain combinations that you can put in. It could have um, whey powder in there. So you, you have this natural spray that you just make yourself and you spray the leaves of your fruit tree. And I have seen this firsthand. It is incredible. Even a struggling tree that's having a hard time, you do the mix you spray the tree, within literally hours, you will see that the leaves get greener. The, the Mostly, fruit trees take in nutrition through their root system, but they can take a very small amount in through their leaves. And their leaves are very strategic because those leaves, those green leaves, can photosynthesize and create more nutrition for the tree, right? So by using these holistic sprays, these customized uh, natural homemade sprays on a regular basis, let's say once a week, you are allowing the tree, encouraging it to photosynthesize more. The more it photosynthesizes, the more energy it has. The more energy your fruit tree has, the more it releases into the soil. They're messy, they're smart, and they're messy. So it makes, let's say, 100 units of energy. And let's say it dumps 70 of those or 30 of you those units into the soil, just as it's like, it's called uh, exudates. Okay, that the roots, the energy comes into the roots and whoops, it splashes out into the soil. Well, in the soil, it attracts microbes who love that yummy, sugary nutrition. They come and gobble it up. They say, hey, I'm going to hang around here because every week I get a big dump of nutrition. They then die, they procreate these little, you know, microbes. Um, the, as they do, they are processing the organic matter in the soil and releasing more nutrients that the trees can take in through their root system. So it is a beautiful symbiotic relationship, a partnership. So the best way, Oliver, for us to, to feed those microbes in the soil is by taking really wonderful care of our trees, just spraying them. Um, on a regular basis, every seven to 10 days. And according to John Kempf in the show, he was saying, you really only need to do this for a year or two. After that, the micro population will be strong. The tree will be strong and they'll just be working beautifully together. And that's when you start to think about the other plants that you can place in your food forest because the trees are set up and ready to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that take. And from my interviews with both John and Nigel, I've really come around to seeing a focus on plant health superseding somewhat um, a little micro view and an obsession with the soil, which is also kind of permeating this space where people just look underground thinking that that's the only source of nutrition or health for the plants themselves. And like you said, the ability for them to uptake nutrients through their leaves, through the stomata and the underside uh, and transpire and how that works to create the conditions in the soil that can get them off of any need for supplementary nutrition from the leaves. Um, and, you know, from Nigel's work too, and a lot of his recipes and his advocacy for amendments in the garden come from natural Korean farming or, or JDAM and the propagation of local microbes. And I, I'm testing with all of these, but it is different with trees in this way that you're working with them over a much larger span of time. You don't have to micromanage them the way that you do annuals. And like you said, if you can focus on doing this, especially in these early years, while they're establishing these relationships with the food web in the soil and learning to get their nutrition uh, from the soil, from these beneficial relationships, you can start to move away from the maintenance as they become more self-sufficient and create this solid base that you've helped to establish in the early years. 
I just also want to say on that point, so what I've learned from both Nigel and John, and this is a fun way to think about it. I'm a livestock farmer and my right. livestock is the microbes in the soil. Right. So I look at the soil differently now. I look at the soil as like my little friends are in there and I want to make sure they get good nutrition. And I, I, it's like when yesterday I went for a walk and looked at the pollinator garden that we have in the park. And I'm a really firm believer that every orchard needs to have like a beautiful insectary or pollinator garden nearby. I see the benefits. Um, but I was looking to see all the insects flocking around all the native plants and how beautiful the garden, the garden is literally beautiful this year. It's incredible. Mm. But I was seeing all that activity. And this is a time in the world where we're having a lot of problems with our environment. And that little piece of land with its buzzing insects is such a success. So I just look at the soil and that's what I want to feel. I want to feel that I've got all this livestock, all these beautiful little creatures in the soil that are helping to nourish all the plants and trees. Yeah, I love that way of looking at it too. You're cultivating a breadth and diversity of life that is going to put most of your functions out of a job, ideally because of how they should be interconnecting, cycling nutrients and other resources on site. But if you don't put in that investment early on, you're going to have to do an, an adequate surrogate of their jobs for a much longer period of time. Now, I'm curious too, as you are paying attention to the growth and development of your trees, what are the indicators that you're looking for to tell you that they're healthy, that they're thriving, that they're doing well? And what are some of the early indicators that you need to maybe step in and help out before it gets to a catastrophic point and you need to do something major? Yeah, over time, uh, the way I see things uh, has changed. So right from well, when, when I started to learn, uh, what I was always looking for was disease. So you know, if you've got diseases, your tree is a little weak. Because the diseases and the pests only attract, uh, the, they are only attracted to the weakest trees. They're like bullies in the schoolyard. They'll pick the weakest kid with the least self-esteem and they're going to get let it rip on that one, right? So it's the same thing. So I that's the basic is look for um, like the unhealthy uh, trees. I also look at the leaves. I look at the size of the leaves. If you feel like one year your apple tree leaves or whatever tree it is that they're smaller than they used to be, trust that. They are smaller because something's going on. If the color isn't glossy and green and it's looking a little weird, something's going on. The nice thing about holistic sprays is that you can just perk them up right away and see how they respond. But it's a very interactive process. Um, if there is no harvest one year, now that we have some apricot trees that seem to be they have a big harvest one year and then nothing the, the next year. And that's normal. But, you know, if one year the harvest is kind of minimal, I'll think, OK, that that tree needs a little more attention. OK, so let's give an example here. Let's say you observe some discoloration of the leaf or a sign that either a fungal disease has moved in or damage from insects. How do you go about making a decision about what intervention, what assistance could help this tree to overcome the challenge it's having. Absolutely. So <laughs> um, here I am, this city girl, uh, with a few orchard in the park, like a little orchard in the park. And um, I realized, I asked myself that question, what do I do when there is a problem? And I kept hearing the words integrated pest management. And I'm like, no, whatever this is, it sounds too fancy for me. I'm not going to learn it. It's that's for real smart people who are farmers and I am not one. I'm never going to learn it. I was so stubborn until I realized, look, until I learn this thing, I'm not going to know how to help my trees. So for, I think, three years in a row, I went to some workshops on integrated pest management during the growing season. And then it dawned on me, this is a scary name for something that's very common sense. And really all it is, is learning to recognize and diagnose the problems. So over time, you'll realize that each type of fruit tree has a very finite amount of diseases and pests that hit it. So for instance, fire blight is a nasty disease, but it really, it mostly hits apple and pear trees. You're not going to find fire blight in your plum tree. 
Um, plum trees can get black knot. That's a different disease. Once you, all you need, all you need is to have an overview of what the different pests and diseases are for the types of trees that you are growing. And then in terms of integrated pest management tools, there is a range of tools that you can use to deal with them. Yes, of course, if, if people are using chemicals, there are some chemical ones, there are some organic chemical ones, there are some holistic spray uh, ones. So if you are finding uh, disease problems in your tree, you will then know how to recognize them. And you will either know some techniques how to deal with them. It could be traps, it could be certain types of sprays, holistic or organic. Um, it could be other, there's a whole load of different options in integrated pest management. It could be pruning, um, but you will choose one of those techniques. So basically I see IPM as learning what the diseases are and the pests and learning the tools that you can use, that you can choose from. And the final thing is learning where to find your answers. There are lots of great resources. You will find one that works for you, for you and then you put all those things together. So to answer your question, uh, when I see pest and disease problems, I turn to integrated pest management to help solve them. In terms of leaves, um, often the solutions are really easy. There hasn't been enough rain this year. You know, so if there hasn't been enough rain, then off you go, do your irrigating and make sure that that happens on a regular basis. If it's, you know, sometimes if the colors look wrong, um, it could be that you need to do another soil test and see, you know, is there, you know, a pH imbalance going on? Is something going on? Sometimes one tree, um, there was some construction near the park and they put an absolutely huge concrete block, enormous chunk concrete block right on the roots of our crab apple tree. And it was, you saw half the tree died. Mm. It was like, there's a reason for everything. There's a reason. Yeah. And so learning to detective your way through the symptoms to figure out what the cause is and then making sure that you're, I mean, <laughs> the perfect analogy is here, getting to the root of the problem, right? And instead of just constantly dealing with symptoms, see if you can solve the thing at the base that can probably open up possibilities for better growth, better nutrition and better production eventually. Now, you have also written about and advocated for ways to accelerate the growth process and to improve yields and harvest. What are some of the ways that you have found that consistently promote these two things that everybody's looking to do with their own trees? Okay, so the answer for that one is counterintuitive. Because when you plant your fruit tree, all you want is a harvest, right? Like you just come on, I want to taste what the fruit is going to taste like. So when you start to see those, the baby fruitlets form, you're like, oh, I can't wait. So I'm going to say for the first two years, remove every single piece of fruit on that tree as it forms. Little baby fruitlets, get rid of them. Take them off gently. Put them in the bucket. If they're healthy, you can put them in your compost. If they're like, if they've got some insect damage, just get them off the site. Put them in the regular garbage, municipal waste, whatever. Um, so first thing is to remove all the baby fruits for the first two years. And the goal is to allow that tree to, again, invest its energy in the root system. We want it to put its energy in expanding that root system far and wide. And the next thing you're going to do is after year, like when it's year three and they're in the ground, look at the fruitlets that are forming on the branches and remove a lot of them. It's called thinning the fruit. So if you let, you want a quality harvest, you want, instead of you can have lots of fruit and it could be a lot of terrible quality fruit, <clears throat> or you can have less fruit that's better quality. The tree will have limited resources. So it, it depends. It's saying to you, okay, if you want to leave every single apple and every cluster on my tree, sure, but I have limited energy. So each apple on that tree will get an equal share of the limited energy that I have. So each apple won't really be very sweet. Um, it probably won't grow to full size because it's crowded in with other apples. So if that's what you want, says the tree, sure, okay, let's go for it. But if you thin the fruit, so if it's apples and you're just thinning your clusters to one or maximum two apples per cluster, each apple will get a larger share of the energy. It will grow bigger, it can be sweeter and more delicious. And then finally, pruning 
One of the goals of pruning, we talked earlier about how pruning can really help increase air circulation in the tree and increase tree health and you know help protect your tree from fungal diseases and other diseases. The other thing correct pruning does is it ensures that every single branch on your tree gets equal access to sunshine. And that means that the fruit on your tree will ripen properly. It's not shaded. So uh, sun is what's going to help that fruit ripen and color up beautifully to be a really good harvest. So if you want a good harvest, make sure you are pruning correctly and make sure you are thinning the fruit and make sure you're feeding your tree um, every year in the early spring. Yeah, you're right. That is counterintuitive. But the way that I've learned to think about it, especially with the cultivars that have the fruit that we're looking for, usually very large, very tasty. That represents a massive amount of energy investment for a tree. The wild versions are usually much smaller, much more tart. They don't concentrate the sugars the same way. And we have bred them to put all of their energy into this fruit. And naturally, that's also the first thing that's going to drop off or compromise in quality if it's stressed, if it doesn't have the nutrition it needs. And one of the ones that I've really learned to notice around here is if it doesn't get enough water. And that is really our limiting factor in this area, partly with the sandy soils and the prolonged droughts in the summer. And so by getting rid of some fruit, you are giving a much better chance that the fruit that you do get by the end is going to be worthwhile. And I personally would much rather do that than end up with a whole bunch of tiny, non-edible or poor quality fruit. I've seen both happen. And to accelerate growth too, is it really that early investment in strong root system that is going to help that? And what we talked about earlier of buying smaller trees with robust root systems, that is the key to that? So you're saying, um, yes, I think so. I mean, I've not studied it, but I think that the younger trees that you've planted bare root... <laughs> Let's put it this way, the healthier they are, the better harvest you'll get out of them. And these younger bare root trees just are healthier. They grow quicker, they adapt to their soil better, they can access the nutrition better so they can produce better quality fruit. But it's also, you know, I talked about it's a conversation with your fruit tree. When you are pruning your tree correctly, you are telling it to produce fruit. You're, you're saying, and it depends how, this is kind of weird to explain but it depends where you prune your branch, okay? So if you've got a fruit tree branch and it's six feet long, let's say, and you prune off, you know, the last, I don't know, foot or two of the branch, okay? What you're doing is you're telling the branch and the tree to put more energy into the remaining buds on that branch. So a couple of things will happen. One is you could get a lot more branches coming from each of those buds. Okay, so it could end up looking quite shrubby when you do a lot of what the, we call heading back cuts. When you cut off an entire branch right to the trunk of the tree, it's almost like the tree forgets the branch was there. It, it's not going to be more shrubby as a result. Instead, it's going to push the energy from the root system in the spring into the other remaining long branches. And those branches will go from the, the tips. Um, they will get longer. So what I'm trying to say is where you prune your tree can make difference and when you prune your tree can make a difference as to whether the tree produces branches or fruit. Um, so I don't know if that's confusing you. It probably is. I, I mean, think I'm confusing me, myself. I've done pruning yeah. <laughs> What's that? That makes sense to me, but I've done quite a bit of pruning myself. So yeah. yeah, so you understand that the different cuts will have different results. And and if you do the right cuts, you will have more fruit on the remaining branches rather than more branches on those branches. Yeah, different types of disturbance and different signals to the entity itself and will trigger different responses. That's the Thank general you. idea behind intervening and disturbing something so that you get a particular result. And if you just go about it willy nilly and start snipping the ends and stuff, you're giving confusing signals that probably aren't going to result in what you want from it. Well stated. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, that I've learned that the similar pattern works for even annual plants, as well as livestock, as well as human relationships. It's like you do need to send out the right signals or create the, the actions that correspond with the response you're looking for. And it takes a while to understand that. Luckily, there's a lot of research. There's a ton of tradition 
in pruning. And actually, that I find that often very confusing because there are so many conflicting ideas around this. Uh, even in my own local area, there are wildly different ideas about how you should prune an olive tree. Luckily, we're in a little microclimate that doesn't grow olives anyway, so I can forget about it. <laughs> but I mean, really, it, it goes back to your focus on creating a relationship. If over time, the interventions that you're you're doing with the tree do not result in what you're looking for, it's time to reevaluate and check something else or do no, new research. And that feedback, that constant conversation that you're cultivating is the, the basis of any relationship. And thinking about it with plants is just such a beautiful idea for me that I really embrace as well. So we're starting to get low on time, but one thing that I was very excited to speak to you about in your unique uh, journey in starting this with a community orchard is, like you said, something that's very attractive to people. The concept of bringing people in your neighborhood together to steward and benefit from the fruits of an orchard also comes with, I'm sure, the learning journey that you found that it's not as simple as just planting the trees, expecting people to come out, take care of them, and harvest them in such a way. What have been some of your key learnings in making the community orchard that you helped to steward successful and have now grown to where it is today? I think the answer is managing expectations and leaving it up to the universe, right? So in terms of a community orchard, these trees are in a public park. We always get a big, beautiful harvest of our cherry trees. They've got so many cherries. The trees are very big. Um, we invite the community to join us, the children, Everybody has so much fun. We we harvest all the cherries together into big bowls, and then we divide it up to the number of participants. So at first, in the early years, people could just go and pick what they want and take their own home. No, that's not what we do, because then people get greedy, and I want this one, and this one's better, and I want that one. No, this is a community effort. We harvest it together. We look at how much or how little the tree produced that year. And if we've got 20 people or families, it gets divided up into 20. You know, it teaches people so much. So the question is, what are our expectations of the orchard? What do we want from the orchard? The orchard gives us so much. It gives us the opportunity to work together, to learn about nature, to build a sense of community, to build a sense of we're all in this together. What it doesn't give us is a whole bunch of fruit because our fruit trees can be so productive, but people are harvesting it all before it's ripe. We're not there, it's not private property. We've got incredibly beautiful, fabulous plum trees. And there is a certain community that harvests the plums while they're green and unripe to use for some sort of pickle. And so we've been in the park where they're there with their big bags, harvesting unripe plums. And we say, what are you doing? And they say, oh, these are very um, good plums. We're going to make them into our national dish, whatever that is. And I say, well, these are this is a public park and you're welcome to take a little bit. But if you take it all, the rest of the community can't enjoy the fruit. We'll never. Can you come along on a harvest day and harvest with everybody else? And then you'll get a share to take home with you. And they say, oh, no, no, we can't. It's too late. We have to do it when it's green. We have to have, you know, we have to use this as green. So we've told them still all the fruit disappears. I've been in the park where there's, you know, maybe an older person with a grandchild harvesting all the apples on the apple trees, just taking them in bags. They're not quite ripe, just taking it. So what, what we understand is that our community orchard isn't about feeding us the volunteers necessarily. And that's the hardest thing because it's so painful as a volunteer when you spend, you know, as a group, we can spend up to 400 hours a year in this park of volunteer hours that we may not enjoy the full harvest, but we get so much more out of those trees. We get to have a relationship with these incredible beings that all they want, their mission is to feed us and to feed wildlife and to make the world a better place, to clean the air, to shade our communities, to beautify our park. You know, so expectations need to be managed and um, the fruits of our labor 
are not just the fruits. They are working together. They are meeting people. They are becoming part of a team that will support you in thick and thin. I'll just say that um, in 2017, I realized I had Lyme disease. I had been kind of getting sicker uh, and I didn't know what I had was a uh, gardener uh, for a few years for the city of Toronto. Long story, but I remember getting the tick bite. I didn't know what ticks were at the time. I remember what the bite looks like. I had no idea that, that that was affecting my health. And it's interesting, the people who cared about me and came to visit when I was at my worst were the volunteers of the orchard. Wow. Those were the people that knocked on my door when I didn't. Yeah, I was scared. Mm. So that's what the community orchard has given me. And yesterday I go to the park to, um, we, we did stewardship this weekend where we had, I don't know, 10 people. Everybody was doing different things, mostly working in the pollinator garden because the trees at this point are taking care of themselves this time of year. And I see the beauty that we've created and I see the insects around pollinator garden and I see the happy people in the park where it was once such a dive that nobody wanted to spend time in. Mm. And I guess that's the fruits of our labors too. So, yeah. That's a really beautiful takeaway. That was not the answer I was expecting. I really figured it would be more about the trees and the harvest itself, but I think that's a really beautiful response. And I think that it says a lot to other types of community projects simply by including other people and populations that you may or may not have direct communication with, you are giving up the control. And like you said, many of the expectations about what you think you're going into it for over to the people who are going to share in the space and in the timeline with you. And to find that the connections are the most important part of it, I think is not only wise, but also inspiring that, I mean, yeah, you can go to a grocery store or you can grow uh, fruit in your backyard and, and get that fruit. But what you can't get is the connection, the relationship, the reliability, the trust and the transformation. I'm sure that that has in your neighborhood, regardless of what that's being the, the point that you set out to in the beginning. I love that. And, uh, and all over the, those trees are fulfilling their purpose. They are producing mm. fruit and somebody is eating it. Mm. And I don't know, you know, that woman or that person who comes with the granddaughter and fills up bags of apple, apples. I don't know what her situation is. Maybe she's a really hungry person who can't afford food. I don't know. The community that makes the pickles, you know, I don't know what their situation is. The good thing is the food is being consumed somehow. And the trees are fulfilling their purpose of bringing abundance, whether it's abundance of love and community spirit or abundance of, of nutrition, it's they're fulfilling their purpose too. Yeah. That's wonderful. That's, that's a really good note to put a bookmark on it for now. But this was such an enriching conversation. It is so timely for me as I'm starting to plan out my nursery and some of the design for the, the orchards going in in the next one and two years. And... I think it's also very relevant for so many people who don't have access to the same amount of size that I do, or are just working with a small backyard, or perhaps what they have access to is a park near their place and the potential to turn it into a community project. I really encourage people to get in touch with you. Can you tell us how they can do that? What resources you have online and the best way to reach out to you will be? Absolutely. Okay. So my website is orchardpeople.com. And at that website, I have lots of articles on fruit tree care. I do a monthly radio show and podcast. So the radio show goes out live on the last Tuesday of every month at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And then I put up a recording of the podcast. I've got a YouTube channel. So Orchard People YouTube channel or something. You can find a lot of my podcasts on there, a lot of videos. And ultimately, if you just if you're ready and you want to learn how to grow fruit trees, I've got online courses. And the main one that most people will start off with is called Certificate in Fruit Tree Care. So they can find that course and all my other courses at learn.orchardpeople.com. 
and I will be there for you. It's a fun course. All the courses I hope are fun. Hopefully I'll make you laugh as well as teach you stuff. Um, but I'll also be there for you. If my students have any questions, they can have one-on-one -on -one meetings with me to discuss their fruit trees, share pictures. Um, I have a meetup group that they can join once a month as well, where we all share our issues and problems and find solutions together. So orchardpeople.com. And then finally, I have two books. One is called Growing Urban Orchards, and the other is called Grow Fruit Trees Fast. And they're both available on Amazon. Fantastic. Well, that's a real wealth of, of knowledge and resources there. I'll link to those in the show notes for this episode. And Susan, it's been such a pleasure. I hope we can maybe do a follow-up in the future as well. I would love that, Oliver. And thank you so much for the work that you're doing and sharing your experiences, the ups and the downs. I think, you know, earlier uh, you and I had talked about the the humility that you need in order to be out there in the world making mistakes as we all do and to be able to share those mistakes and laugh about them and know that if we're not making mistakes we're not learning and so i love the fact that both of us we're out there making our podcasts and our educational materials and saying okay this works and this didn't so guys you don't have to do the one that didn't work so thank you so much for all the work that you're doing oliver you can find all the links to her online resources, courses, website, and book in the show notes on the website at regenerativeskills.com. Now, before we wrap this up, just remember that these episodes are only the beginning of the learning resources, design and coaching services, in-person courses, and interactive community that are available through Regenerative Skills. The Discord server is our free community where you can connect with other like-minded listeners, exchange ideas, stories, tips, and resources, as well as interact with me directly and quite a few former guests from this show. Our Instagram account, at regen underscore skills, is the best place to see the projects that me and the team are working on, both for clients and collaborators, as well as on our own properties. I'll also be announcing the certification courses, workshops, and gatherings that we've got coming up later this year. If you're interested in getting dedicated support for your own project, you can now schedule a free planning session with one of our team members through the request form on our website. You can also find all the links, show notes, and past resources there at regenerativeskills.com. We truly believe that no matter your experience, your knowledge, abilities, resources, or background, you can be a powerful force for regeneration on this planet, and we're here to help you find your path. So as always, remember to keep taking those little steps every day towards a regenerative future, and I'll be right by your side along the way. Thank you.